Thank you for joining us today for our worldwide Bible study. And today we're focusing upon a subject that I believe will be of great help to every single listener. We're going to be doing a Bible study on three ways that you can discover the will of God for your life. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, there is a God and you matter to him. He loves you and he has a plan and a destiny and a will for your life. And your choices, don't miss this, your choices for your life and your life goals will never be better than the choices and the destiny that God has for your life. And if you have a right relationship with God, you genuinely need to listen carefully because there is a biblical map on how we walk in the will of God. Some of you perhaps have never been taught biblically the map of knowing the will of God. This Bible study will be a great help to you. But if you do not have right relationship with God, I never close one of our teachings without praying for you and with you. And I would challenge you to patiently listen to the end. Maybe you've never had someone love you enough to look you in the eyes and answer the question, how can I know in my heart that I'm right with God? We'll cover that at the very end, and I'd like to pray with you. To have a right relationship with God, not according to me, not according to a denomination, but according to the eternal word of God, there are three things that you must do. To have a right relationship with God, number one, you have to recognize your sin. All have sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of the glory of God. That includes me, that includes you. Not only must you recognize your sin, the Bible says you have to repent of your sin. That's a word we don't use much in the 21st century, repent. It simply means to make a U-turn or to turn your back on sin and by faith turn your heart to Christ. And number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior in childlike faith and humility. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so if that's all brand new content to you or information or perhaps you didn't grow up in a home where there was any exercise of faith or religiosity and you're hearing it all for the first time, can I just say that not only does God love you, I care about you, and it is my goal to provide a platform to help you come to faith in Christ and to begin a walk with God. And then this study three ways to discover the will of God in your life will absolutely radically change how you get up every day because now you'll know it's not just you at the wheel. God is there beside you each and every day. Do you know God's will for your life? Are you certain that you're walking in the will of God for your life? Well, if not, this will be a great time of study. Let's go into the book of Isaiah. And the 30th chapter, uh, Isaiah, if you're a brand new Christian, is in the Old Testament uh, at the Bible college and seminary, our professors, and as we teach on the scriptures, uh, you would learn that in the Old Testament, we have two divisions of the prophetic books. We have what are called major prophets, and we have what are called minor prophets. And if you were taking uh, theological education at an accredited institution, uh, no doubt probably either in your freshman year, your sophomore year, you would take courses on major prophets and minor prophets. Why are they called major prophets? They're not called major prophets because their books are more important than the minor prophets. They're simply in the world of theology called major prophets because their books are longer and have much more content and thus the minor prophets are called minor prophets uh, books like Amos and Joel and so on their books are very brief and have very limited content 
And so as a student of the Bible, make note of that, that in the Old Testament we have the major prophets and the minor prophets, and the book we're reading out of today, out of the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, is a major prophet, and we begin reading in the 30th chapter, beginning to read at verse 18, and I'm reading through uh, verse 21 out of the New Living Translation. The scripture says, so the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. Highlight that. And if you're one of our new students of the hundreds of thousands of people that study the Bible with us each and every month, we ask you to come to this school of the Bible. Just bring your Bible, bring a way of taking notes, whether you do a legal pad or a Modern digital device makes no difference to me. But I do encourage you to begin to take systematic notes because as you become a part of this classroom, if you'll allow me to become a trusted voice in your life for learning the scriptures and securing your faith, you need to be a serious student of the scripture. The Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I also ask you to bring a highlighter because I want you eventually to have a well-worn, marked-up Bible as you learn many of these classic truths along with classic passages. So in Isaiah 30 and verse 18, put a highlighter through, So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. Have you ever thought about that before? God is literally waiting for you to come to him. The invitation was already made when he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and lived out his earthly ministry, knowing that he would go to the cross, knowing that he would be the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world, that was God's personal invitation to the world. That's what John 3.16 means. When it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the cross and Christ is God's everlasting invitation to all, whosoever will, the scripture says, may come. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so that he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. He will be gracious if you ask for help. God will be gracious to you no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing. Prior to coming into our media set to record and to provide this Bible study for you, I was reading a number of actual letters that have been mailed in from people who study the Bible with us and are a part of the ministry of Lost Lamb. And many of them in those letters share heartbreaking stories. Uh, one was about a marriage, a woman who found faith in Christ through this content and through our ministry and was writing how she had came to faith in Christ. But she's struggling because she's in a marriage where there are some long-term problems and she's discouraged because it doesn't seem that there's any change or improvement even though she's praying and she wrote in detail wondering about the very things that we're going to be talking about today because there's a will of God for your life even when you're going through stuff even when you're going through the storms of life and you're facing those difficult frustrating battles that so many of you are engaged in. That does not stop the will of God for your life. He's able to take you through mountaintop experiences and he's equally able to lead you by the hand through the valleys of life and take you from where you're at to where you need to be. Another woman that wrote was brokenhearted because she also came to faith through this ministry 
and she's begun to pray for her family and in particular for her grandsons and she shared the heartbreaking details that I'll not go over in this teaching about her grandsons and it involves drug addiction and other problems needing answers. Many people are not aware that God genuinely cares about the details of your life and he has a plan and he has a perfect will. The Bible goes on to say, blessed are those who wait for his help. Verse 19, O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. He will be gracious if you ask for help. He will surely respond to the sound of your cries. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, He will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear Him. Right behind you, a voice will say, This is the way you should go whether to the right or to the left. And I want you to run a highlighter through those encouraging words. This is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. As we always do, let's begin our study in prayer and let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the sacred scriptures, we humble our heart in your holy presence and confess our complete and total dependence upon you. I pray that by the Spirit of the Lord and through the integrity of the Bible, you will help me to adequately communicate to every single listener the love of God for them. And may they never question another day going forward that you have a will and a plan and a destiny for all your sons and all your daughters. And if there are those who are listening who perhaps have never come to faith and they are perhaps unaware of the fact that you can change their life, as you said in the book of Isaiah that we just read, you are waiting for people to respond and to ask for your gracious help. May people today around the world Feel the love and the calling of God's Holy Spirit. And may today be the day that they ask for your gracious help. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Can I begin in the infancy of this study by telling you that you can't change your past, but you can change your future. And the Bible tells us that when a person comes to faith in God, the scripture says, if any man comes to Christ, and that word man in the original Greek manuscript is generic, it means male and female. Many of you know that a lot of old writings were written in the masculine, and so it's important for all of our ladies that follow our Bible studies to know that God is not a chauvinist. It means literally in the Greek, it's generic. It means male or female. But it says, if any man comes to Christ, or if any person, any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, if anyone comes to Christ, they become a brand new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. So the first thing that you have to check on your box of change is your past is your past. And no matter what your past is, God can forgive it, God can forget it, and today you can begin a brand new day and a brand new life. And you can walk away, perhaps by God's providence, you're listening right now because God has been trying to reach out to you and to tell you, hey, I care about you, I have a plan for your life, I have a will for your life, and here are three ways that you can walk in God's perfect will. That's what we're focus, focusing on. So with that in mind, for all of our students that take systematic notes, here are three biblical keys to walking in the will of God for your life. Number one, you have to commit 
all your decisions to the Lord. Let me repeat that. Three ways to know the will of God for your life. Number one, you must commit all your ways to the Lord. If you have your Bible, go with me into uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs is right after the Old Testament uh, book of Psalms. And the uh, third chapter, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Listen to this incredible wise counsel. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend upon your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do. Run your highlighter through that. Seek His will in all you do. And He will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. If it is of importance to you, it is of importance to God. Too many times people think that God doesn't care about me, and if He does care about me, He only cares about a handful of major decisions in my life because He's got way too much going on. My life is insignificant. No, that is the exact opposite of what the Bible just told us in Proverbs chapter 3, and it tells us the same in multiple other passages. Everybody is somebody to God. You're important to God. I don't care if people have made you feel unimportant. I don't care if you grew up in a home where you were made to feel insignificant. I don't care if your entire life you were surrounded with people who either purposefully or maybe without purpose constantly made you feel insecure and meaningless. I ask you in Jesus' name, quit that mess. And realize that with God, everybody is somebody to God. And all of your decisions in life are important to God. You cannot begin to understand the power and the might of God to care for all of the details of people whom He loves around the world, but the Bible cannot lie, and it says, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Now, what does that mean practically? Well, literally, exactly what it says. Like, for example, every day in my life, I talk to God out loud. I don't have to be in a church to pray. I don't need to be in a building with stained glass windows to pray, although I love my pastor and I love my local church, and I love the fellowship of being there when my schedule allows me to be home. Every Sunday, when I'm not traveling around the world, Judy and I get up and we go to church. And I thank God for that. But let me tell you something. I do 95% of my talking to God in jeans and boots. If the camera were to go a little lower, you would see that I have on my favorite jeans and one of my favorite pair of boots. God doesn't need me in suit and tie. He doesn't need me in doctoral robes at the college in pomp and circumstance for me to pray. My prayers in my jeans and my boots are just as powerful as my prayers in suits and ties in churches and cathedrals and sanctuaries around the world. And you need to understand that as well. God cares about every detail of your life. And the first of three steps to walking in the perfect will of God is you need to get into the habit of talking to God about everything you do. Pray. That just means talk. And it also means pause and listen. Father, I dedicate this day to you. Direct my steps. Whatever choices you may have to make that day, 
Bring them to the Lord in prayer, in your business, in your job, in your career, in your education, in your home life, in your marriage, in your child rearing. Bring all of your decisions every day to the Lord in prayer. And as you begin to get into the habit of acknowledging him in all your ways, what did he say he would do? He said, if you'll do your, your part, I will direct your steps. And sometimes that just happens effortlessly. And what I mean by that is when you baptize all decisions in consecration to acknowledging God in prayer, stuff just seems to come together. God goes before you and he makes crooked paths straight because Christians are not immune from making wrong decisions. And don't miss what I'm about to say. Minor life decisions can have major lifelong consequences. Let me say that again, and if you're taking notes, write it down. Minor life decisions can have lifetime major consequences. For example, uh, I met a young lady not long ago, and her story is not rare. Sadly, it's quite common. In a relationship, outside of marriage, uh, being pressured by a young man who kept telling her that if you really love me, you'll be intimate with me. In a moment of weakness, she gave in, and the result of that sexual union was the birth of a child. Upon the birth of the child, as sadly is often true, that individual of low character and low morals left her had no desire to be a dad, had no desire to marry her. And in a vulnerable moment, in one night of what was seemingly a minor time and a minor decision, it changed the course of her life for the rest of her days. And we could add a multitude of scenarios in there. But listen to what I'm teaching you and telling you from the precepts of the Bible. Minor life decisions can have major consequential lifetime impact. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Three ways to determine and discover the will of God for your life. Number one, in all of your ways acknowledge him. Bring everything to God in prayer. Number two, read the scriptures. This will not be difficult, but understanding the simplicity of what I'm about to teach you does not always mean you're going to grasp the incredible power of what I'm about to teach you. So listen very carefully. I'm not just talking about reading the Bible getting up every day with some legalistic religious effort of, you know, I'm going to read five chapters in the Bible every day. And if you do that, I'm not condemning that. Thank God for discipline and commitment. But the Bible doesn't just say read. It says study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why you hear me say repeatedly, and I repeat things not because I don't have things to say. I repeat things because, first of all, uh, the data is showing me that we have thousands of new students coming on every single month. And so some of you have listened to me for years. Others of you have listened to me for months, some weeks, and some of you have just found me today. But I oftentimes say, I hope and I pray that I can become a trusted voice in your life for teaching you the Bible. And as many of you know, we spend a lot of time teaching on Bible prophecy and end time events and eschatology because we're living in the last days and there are so many chaotic things that are going on in the world today that are straight out of the pages of Bible prophecy. If you're a new student, you'll be learning Bible prophecy as you stay in touch 
with our channel. Read the scriptures. The journey of the will of God is not a highway. Don't miss this. The will of God in your life is not a highway. What do you mean by that? Well, yesterday when Judy and I had completed uh, all of our work and uh, when I'm at the college and the seminary, I oftentimes have meetings and conferences with team leaders uh, from early in the morning till late in the day with rarely a break. But uh, at the end of the day, Judy and I had to return back here to our Lost Lamb ministry office and to home and uh, here in the chair with you today and happy to be here. But we got on the highway and it's actually a fairly easy drive. I just get on 95 North and I stay on 95 North for a little over three hours, three and a half hours, and it gets to the exit, which is close by home, and it's really kind of a simple cruise control drive of about three and a half hours. Life in the will of God is not a highway. It's not straight where you just put it on cruise control. Here it is, if you're writing down, here's a solid piece of biblical golden wisdom. The will of God is not a highway. It is a wilderness path. Let me say that again. The will of God in your life is not a highway. It is a wilderness path. Now, some of you that are listening to me have never had one day in your life in the wilderness. You've never spent a single night in the wilderness, have no desire to, and I'm not making fun of that. I know that that's probably the majority of people. I know that I'm probably the odd man out, and I openly confess to you that I love the wilderness. I love the outdoors. Uh, I wish I had more time to take a backpack in my canoe and disappear off grid and enjoy the world that God created and fish. And I, I just love that stuff, and I'll openly confess to that. If you want to judge me for being a country boy, that's up to you. And the state that I live in, the state of Maine, here in the northeast of the United States of America, over 98% of our state is untouched wilderness, and I love it. But when you go into the wilderness, there's no paved highway. It's wilderness trails. It's game trails. What do I mean by game trails? You know, deer and moose and mountain lions and coyotes and on down the line. All of the wildlife in Maine, bears, they form paths in the wood. Many times those paths in the woods lead to water or they'll lead to berry patches or, or whatever. But animals oftentimes create their own trails in the wilderness. And if you're not paying attention, you may never notice them. And there's forks, and there's bends, and there's cliffs that you have to be careful you don't just walk over. That's what the will of God is like. It's not a highway where you get saved and give your heart to Christ, and then you just close your eyes and go to sleep at the wheel. God needs to have your undivided attention every day. And the Bible said that His Word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Here's another solid piece of gold. Don't miss it. You will never know the will of God any greater than you know the Word of God. Let me say it again. It's that powerfully important. You will never know the will of God any better than you know the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is His written will. And everything that God does in your life will always be in agreement with the Scriptures. How many times have I heard, and perhaps you as well, I've heard ministers and various people on social media who claim to be Christians or claim to be teachers, they say something like this, well, I know the Bible says this, but God gave me a special revelation, and I want to share it with you. I'm not interested in your foolishness. God doesn't give any revelation that's contrary to what's written in the Bible. And people who tell you that God has given them special revelation, 
you need to be careful because all teaching, all truth, all precepts, all doctrine must come into full agreement with what is written in the Holy Scriptures. God will never tell you, listen, God will never tell you to do something or make a decision that violates the Bible. Let me just give you one classic example that's commonly violated. I hear because I'm around uh, young people and people who are in relationships or people who have gone through painful divorces and, and so on. In the area of relationships, I've heard people say, well, you know, I know this man or I know this woman. I, I know they're not a Christian. And I know they're still battling some issues in life and they've been in rehab and they're still battling alcoholism, but the Lord spoke to me that they're going to be my spouse. Now, I'm not in any way demeaning people that battle issues and addictions. But God, if you're a believer, will never call you to be in a relationship with an unbeliever. Now, some of you are already in that state, but it didn't start out that way. Perhaps you were married and maybe the wife came to Christ and the husband has not yet come to Christ. Or the husband came to Christ and the spouse has not yet come to Christ. Well, you have to remain in that marriage, the Bible tells us, as long as the unbelieving spouse wants to remain married. And by the way, I have a teaching that will soon be coming out both on our YouTube channel, our podcast channel, and our Facebook videos that will be dealing with the complexities of living in a divided marriage. So I want you to keep an eye open for that content. It's coming soon. Many of you have been writing and asking questions about that, and I haven't forgotten you. We're going to be doing a teaching on how do you survive a divided and a divisive marriage, and that'll be of help to you. But some people have come to me and say, hey, I know that my fiance is not a Christian and they have no desire for the things of God, but God told me to marry them and I know he's going to fix them. The Bible says that you should not be involved in a relationship where an individual is right with God and an individual is not right with God. The Bible tells us that darkness and light should not have fellowship together, and it's specifically talking about being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Again, I have content coming up on that. We'll deal with that in depth, so stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already because you'll enjoy that teaching. I know that there are multiplied thousands of you who are listening right now who are in that very state. But if you're not, listen carefully. If you would have just known what the Bible said, you never would have made that wrong decision. And decisions that violate the Bible will always take a left turn and bring you out of the will of God. And there are consequences that will always follow. The first check and balance of all your decisions in life must be brought into the direction of what does the Bible say. Can I say that again? The first check and balance of all life decisions needs to be brought into the light of the Scripture so that you can know what God has already stated as His will and thereby know what decision should be made. Let me say it one more time in a summation statement. Your knowledge of the Bible is proportionate to your knowledge of walking in the will and the ways of God. Lastly, and I close with this, principle number three. Again, in this Bible study, three ways to discover the will of God for your life. Number one, in all your ways, acknowledge God. Talk to God in prayer about everything. Number two, read the scriptures because the Bible is the ultimate compass for the will and the way and the wisdom of God for your life. It will always show you true north in the path because the will of God is not a highway. It's a wilderness path. 
And there are a lot of forks and a lot of turns and a lot of things that if you're not careful, you can lose your way and get turned around. But what did the scripture say? God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It will always show you the will of God. Lastly, seek godly advice. It's a biblical principle that sadly many people don't embrace, or at least they don't embrace it consistently throughout life. But you should surround yourself with a handful of godly people because they'll help you discern and know the will of God for your life. God never intended for you to be an independent, rogue island separated as unto yourself. Turn with me into uh, the 11th chapter of the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. The Bible says, Without wise leadership, a nation falls, but there is safety in having many advisors. There is safety in having many advisors. The King James Version that I grew up on says, In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom and safety. And so wise Christians who are committed to walking in success, walking in progress, walking in a path with God that's always forward and always upward, those people understand these three biblical keys to discerning and knowing and discovering the will of God. They keep godly people in their life and they listen to them. Again, I constantly, when I pray for this time of ministry, our Bible study, and for the multiple hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who tune in to learn the scriptures with me, I take very seriously, I pray I can earn the respect and the right to be a trusted voice in your life because I have no desire other than what the Bible says. I have no denominational bent, and I'm not criticizing denominations, although in heaven there will be no denominations. I care about you as a person. Whether you grew up in church or grew up in a home where your parents were atheists or you're brand new to beginning to study the scriptures, I want to be one of those trusted advisors. I will help you if you'll listen, learn the scriptures, rightly divide the word of truth, and take the Bible and make it that lamp under your feet and that light unto your path. Because God has given some people a gift of special wisdom, and he'll put them into your life. When God wants to change your life, he usually will put somebody new in your life. And it'll be a positive impact, not a negative impact. Some of you need to remove some people from your inner circle. The Bible says, Paul wrote these words to the church at Corinth. I believe it's in 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. It says, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. The people you surround yourself will impact and influence the will of God and how it's executed in your life. That's why you need a good church with a Bible-believing pastor. That pastor should be one of those points of contact and the advice and the message. And I wish I could tell you that 100% of churches have pastors that are godly. But sadly, there are churches that are cults. There are churches that are bent to a denominational creed that's not in agreement with what the Bible teaches. But every follower of Christ should have a Bible-believing church with the godly pastor. And I pray that the Lord brings that into your life if you don't already have it. But in that journey, if you're not there yet, I pray that perhaps I might find that trust in your heart. I want to teach you the Bible and keep you on the center lane of God's perfect will for your life. And just in my own life, I practice what I preach. I have a handful of people in my life 
that are godly and tenured and they're scholars they understand the scripture they've given their lives to things that are sacred and holy and many times in a time of decision i go to them and pray with them and seek their advice and many times it just confirms what god's already doing in my life i've done the same thing as the newly elected president of north point bible college and seminary i've created a team leadership model and I've taken all of the arterial needs of the seminary and the Bible college and broken them down into things that need chairman and leadership. And they report to me. We work together. We pray together. I have a handful of people at the Bible college that are not on faculty and staff, that are outside of the college and the seminary, who have backgrounds in academia, etc. And we have debriefing calls on a regular basis multiple times a week. I practice what I'm teaching you. I have people in my life that are godly advisors and I run by the things that I feel God is directing me to do. I run that by those advisors on a regular basis to see if indeed the Bible says in the multitude of counselors there's wisdom and safety. And the Bible also says if two or three agree together as touching anything on earth in the will of God, he will do it. I close with this. God's will is knowable and it's provable. Now when you're a brand new Christian, it's going to be a little different. Because when you're a brand new Christian, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. But when you're a brand new Christian, those godly urges, that wisdom that seems to come out of nowhere and seems to guide you and tell you what to do, and it's almost like a wind in your sail helping you make decisions. When you're a brand new believer, you're going to be a bit doubtful. You're going to be a little skeptical. You're going to wonder. You're going to have questions that will go through your mind. Is that God directing my steps or is that me? Is that God prompting me to move in this direction or is that my own carnal impulse? Is that my mother speaking the way I was raised? Is that my father speaking the way I was raised? Is that my own carnal thought or is it God? When you're a brand new Christian, you probably will have some doubts and questions, which is why you need to have yourself surrounded by a handful of godly advisors and counselors. But the more you walk with God, let me encourage you, the more you walk with God and the more answers to prayer that you begin to put in the file of your memories of how God brought you through, there will come a time in your life when you will know the voice of God in your spirit totally different than you know your own voice and your own imagination. Now, can I be honest with you? I believe that God can speak speak to people audibly. We see it in the scriptures. But in all of my life of serving the Lord, which is now close to 60 years of serving the Lord, I have never heard the audible voice of God. But there is a voice, and not audible, but there is a voice inside that I know to be the voice of God. Because it's not my thoughts, it's not my will, it's not my way. And every now and then as I'm praying and carrying out what I'm teaching you, number one, I acknowledge Him in all my ways in prayer. Number two, I read and study the scriptures to confirm that indeed what I'm doing doesn't violate the Bible. Number three, I have counselors and advisors in my life that are godly that pray with me and give me counsel and direction. And many times it confirms in my spirit exactly what I feel God leading me to do. The more you walk in the clarity of that, trust me when I tell you there will come a day when you'll know what the scripture says. My sheep know my voice and God will direct your steps. One last scripture and then let's pray. Let's go into the New Testament to the book of Romans and thank you for your time today. We close with this beautiful passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. God's will is knowable and God's will is provable. 
Where does it say that in the Bible? Romans 12 and verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be sure to run a highlighter through that. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice that it says that the child of God has to make a decision to no longer be conformed to the world. You cannot live with the volume of the world turned up in one ear and wonder why you can't hear the still small voice of God in the other ear. Did you get that? If you're going to live for God, you've got to separate yourself from things that are wicked and perverse and unholy, things that violate the integrity of the Bible. You're going to have to part company with certain people because they're an anchor in your life, always pulling you to sin, always pulling you to failure, always pulling you to bad decisions. It doesn't mean that you have to be mean and rude. You just have to quit putting so much time in with them. And some of them you're going to have to completely break off the relationship because they've been nothing but trouble your entire life, and they're not going to change, but you have changed. And you've got to make up your mind. If I want to live in the will of God, I've got to sanctify my life. I've got to make a commitment to live with holiness and humility and honor. And I have to believe that these three principles will guide me in the perfect will of God. And that's our Bible study today. Three ways to discover the will of God in your life. Number one, in all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Number two, read the Bible. Your knowledge of the will of God will always be proportionate to your knowledge of the Word of God because the Word of God is the will of God. And number three, Select and surround yourself with godly advisors and counselors. In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom and safety. And when you come to a fork in the road and you're not sure whether it's a green light or a yellow light or a red light, and you're not 100% sure as to what to do, those godly counselors will oftentimes bring clarity to confusion and the fog of Doubt and unbelief will be blown away by the confirmation of God's Holy Spirit and you can live in the will of God every day of your life and that's my prayer for you. As we close our Bible study, if you don't know God personally in the sense of has there ever been a time, can I make it this simple? Do you have a distinct, clear memory of a time in your life when you've repented of sin and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? I am so thankful for the hundreds of people who through this content are finding their way to faith, many for the very first time, many of them coming back home. So whether you pray this prayer with me and it's the very first time or you're coming back home, I always conclude by praying with you. Every single teaching will be here at the end to pray for you. So if you're not sure, you're right with God, but down deep in your heart, you're saying, Tiff, I want to know God. It's been difficult for me. I didn't grow up religious. But if God cares about me, nothing in the world has satisfied me and filled the emptiness inside. If God has a plan and a will and a destiny for my life, I want to make Him my Heavenly Father through faith in Jesus Christ. Will you just pray a simple prayer with me right now? And when you're done praying, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org. It'll be on the screen. And click on New Beginnings. I have a series of teachings specifically designed for those of you who are coming to faith in Christ. And before you listen to all of our other other content, listen to that series on New Beginnings. 
Let's pray together. Wherever you're at, in childlike faith, just say, Heavenly Father, I want to begin a relationship with you and walk in your perfect will. Today I recognize my sin and I repent. In childlike faith I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus Christ, your only Son. I trust in the cross and the blood that was shed. Cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit from all impurity, all sin. Come into my heart today and be my Lord and Savior. I receive salvation now as the gift of God. And I vow this day that I'll serve you all the days of my life. May I have that desire and may it never leave to live and to know the will of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come in to stay. Come in to my heart. Lord Jesus.